As long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh. Welcome to this new episode of Hold Your Fire. Today we're going to be talking about a war that's erupted in the Caucasus, a flare-up in Nagorno-Karabakh with hundreds of casualties, and we'll be joined by Olesya Vartanyan for what promises to be a very deep and very personal uh, mm. personal exchange. But before we do that, uh, Naz, you know, we always try to do this week in review. So much has happened this week just yes. from the country in which we both are sitting in the U.S., where... Actually, there was a debate, uh, a debate between President Trump and Vice President Biden, which had, at one level, nothing to do with foreign policy. Mm. They, I don't think they said a word about it. On the other hand, it has everything to do with foreign policy because the entire world was probably watching in shock as they saw this debate unfold. And then, of course, President Trump came down, was diagnosed with coronavirus. So, so much has happened. It's hard to remember everything. One thing I would want to note is that we mark now the, the second anniversary of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist who was murdered in the uh, Saudi consulate in Istanbul by, by mm. Saudi agents. And it's an issue that it's not over and uh, people have not forgotten and they shouldn't forget. Mm. And I think we've also been tracking and we've had a bit of discussion. Uh, Turkey seems to be showing up in so many of our conversations these weeks. And there has been a decision after much negotiation that the EU will be undertaking sanctions against Belarus. They've named, uh, I think, about 40 individuals against whom there will be targeted sanctions in Belarus. And this involves Turkey because, of course, Cyprus had been blocking the decision to move forward with the sanctions. The EU, of course, requiring a consensus to take this decision right. on the grounds that they wanted an agreement that there could potentially be sanctions against Turkey. What do you make of this? Well, I mean, first, I think you're right. And we really have to come back soon to the Turkey. And we will come back to it in our next conversation, I'm sure, because Turkey is involved in the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, but, you know, one of the things this makes me think about, as it always does, is when there's a crisis, as there is in Belarus, as there may be with Turkey, mm. the option of first resort seems to be sanctions. Mm. Now, maybe that's better than doing nothing, although it's very unclear to me that sanctions are going to make Lukashenko, the president of, of Belarus, move. Hard for me to see how sanctions are going to make Turkey move. So again, an issue I think we need to come back to, but time and time again, it's either it seems to be either military intervention with all of the drawbacks and the, the potential for, to backfire, or sanctions, which often hurt the people they're intended to help and help the people they're intended to hurt. Absolutely. And I think some of the work that we do on international law and conflict issues at PLAC, I think one of the things we've been thinking about a lot this year in particular is what does it look like to know if sanctions are working, right? If, as you say, they're framed as the better alternative to the use of force or to military pressure, how do we as a, as a global community judge if they are actually achieving anything, if they are achieving the objectives that they claim to be achieving? And, and I do think there is this sense that there, there is a question of how do you force the hand of individuals within a particular state when you don't like what they are doing, right? That in right. a sense, this is not the kind of sanctions where you're saying you have broken a rule that you agreed to and now the punishment that we all know will be served is, is this particular sanction, but rather this attempt to use sanctions to alter the behavior of individual actors or of individual states. And it does look like, I saw today, that it looks like uh, Russia is uh, preparing to respond to the EU sanctions and support Belarus in some way. So I think uh, we'll see. I mean, I'd say and one last comment on this. You know, when I was working in the Obama administration, and I, I certainly was not an advocate of military intervention in so many of these cases, but then the, 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 the argument was, well, we have to do something. We have to show that we yes. are active. And then the tool is sanctions. And Jack Lew, who was then the Treasury Secretary, would say, OK, you guys want to impose sanctions. We're here to do that. But think about how far we're going, how, you know, if this becomes the tool we use every time, we're going to erode and undermine the value of that tool. And at some point, 
the rest of the world is going to say if it is U.S. sanctions, and now I'm coming back to on the U.S. side, if it's U.S. sanctions, the rest of the world will say enough already of U.S. imposing sanctions. We're going to try to build a autonomous financial sector, which is very hard to be uh, immune from the, the long arm of U.S. sanctions. But we're talking about Europe, so this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. It is a global one. And when there seems to be nothing else to do, people do turn to sanctions not always calculating, A, its effectiveness, as you just said, in terms of the objectives that are set, and B, its downsides. Again, I'm sure we'll come back to it because there's very few conflicts that we are involved in where sanctions don't have a role to some extent or another. But why don't we turn now to the meat of our conversation on Nagorno-Karabakh. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today we're going to be talking about the tragic conflict that's erupted in the Caucasus, the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, which began about 12 days ago, and the casualties are now can be counted in the hundreds. To talk to us about that, we're welcoming Olesia Vartanyan. Olesia, hello. Hi, nice to be with you. So Olesia, you're, you're our senior analyst for the, for the Caucasus, but in fact you started with us several years ago as a Justra Fellow, Frank Justra Fellow working in the area and you have since spent a lot of time you so impressed us that we very quickly promoted you to senior analyst and you're now joining us today from uh, Tbilisi. Could you help us understand you know, what are the origins of the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, how it started and what, what are the stakes? What is this fighting all about? Well, the conflict is about 30 years old. No, it started with uh, protests uh, in Stepanakert, which is the main town inside Nagorno-Karabakh, with the Armenians demanding to make the region part of uh, Armenian Soviet Republic at the time. Then the collapse of the Soviet Union came, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, declared its independence, Armenia Azerbaijan also declared their independence, and they were not able to find a way to, you know, to pacify with calls of the local Armenians. Uh, the war started and that lasted for two years. And since then, the conflict zone, which is not only Nagorno-Karabakh itself, but also seven region, adjacent regions, they have been under the control of the Armenian forces. There were a number of attempts to find a peaceful solution, different mediators, uh, they were proposing different peace plans. But unfortunately, sometimes even at the very last moment, uh, all the talks failed, you know, they were failing. And uh, this has been the case in the recent decade as well. About 10 years ago, there was a robust attempt by Russians. And uh, since then, basically, you know, the talks have been in a very deep deadlock. And that was something that everyone was worried about because simultaneously, we were seeing that on both sides uh, they were purchasing huge numbers of weaponry, that rhetoric was becoming more heated, uh, less space for compromise, and, and it was sometimes even kind of, you know, I would meet diplomats and they would tell me, the war is coming, we just don't know the day. And uh, that was so difficult for me as a person who lives in this region to hear because our goal at the crisis group is actually to find a way to prevent the war. You, you and I traveled uh, together. Well, you, you were there, but I came to, to meet you in Yerevan and we met with officials there. What was it? Eight months ago, maybe. I also went to Baku with our, our colleague who works there. I came out of that those two visits with this feeling that this is a frozen conflict that could that could explode at any time for one reason. And I want to hear your reaction to this. What I heard in Azerbaijan was great frustration. You know, they feel like they, you know, they had lost the territory. The territory was under control of the Armenians. And it had been, you know, years and years and years with, with no progress. And even though I can't say that I felt that they wanted to rush to war, what I heard in, in what they were saying is that they felt that maybe the only way they were going to be able to move things was uh, through a, a revival of the hot war, of the confrontation. Is that also your perception? How, how would people in Armenia react if they hear that? You know, I think uh, many people told me, I mean, in my uh, during my travels, uh, when I spoke to people who are directly affected by the conflict, that was a uh, quite ordinary thing, you know, even for young males of my age, you know. I would never forget one of my very first conversations with a young Armenian soldier, and he told me, I will get married only after a big war. 
So that was kind of, you know, a standing thinking that something was about to happen and uh, that we need to prepare for that. And there is very little room and hope that we can find a solution through peaceful means. And that was uh, extremely frustrating. And, but at the same time, those who worked on this, we saw that, you know, and uh, not only me, but uh, primarily the diplomats who have been involved in that. And, and they were also the people who were knocking on different doors in capitals, telling them that, look, guys, if this happens, that will be a disaster. And unfortunately, we were not able to, to prevent it. What we are seeing is a large-scale attack, you know, that took place from the Azerbaijani side. They denied it. And uh, they continuously saying that that was a provocation, we had to respond to all these things, you know, that we hear not only in this conflict and not only in this war, but in many others. But the, it's obvious that uh, there was no Armenian interest. The Armenians were interested in keeping the status quo. They wanted to, to continue and probably, you know, to postpone the decision to, till they hopefully can have a person in Baku they could find a, a compromise with. There were the times uh, when I read the books, you know, about what was happening, let's say, 20 years ago in the negotiation process or 15 years ago. I can see that there, at that time there was more space and more flexibility from both sides. And uh, both were, uh, showed much more readiness to go for a compromise that is impossible, completely impossible even to touch. Uh, even before this fighting, after this fighting, it will be... Um, I, I cannot even imagine how to put this agenda uh, on the table for negotiations. Well, Lestia, can I ask a number of questions I have from what you just said? First, especially for those who have not been following this conflict and this situation as closely as you have and are not living it the way you are, can you tell us a bit about the current situation? How did we get here and what is at stake right now? Is this the big war that, that, that many have been waiting for? Or is there a sense that this is an effort to um, establish some kind of different territorial status between all the parties? I think on both sides, we get uh, this feeling, you know, and the, that uh, this is the big war, the war that we expected, and this will be our last battle. I, I hear from Armenians, you know, saying that this is the war that basically will determine whether Armenians are to stay uh, in the South Caucasus altogether. They see it, they, they give different names to it, but all of them are related to some very historical moment when Armenians were nearly completely killed or uh, the nation stopped existing in terms of like a kingdom, you know, or, uh, or a state or a country. And uh, on the Azerbaijani side, the longer it goes, the deeper is the advance of the Azerbaijani army inside the conflict zone, the less I see calls for peace, you know, the less I see people saying that there was a possibility to re resolve this conflict through the peaceful means. Uh, some of them are so frustrating to see because I know these people, we met before, and like one of them yesterday just, uh, you know, made a public comment saying that, why did we wait for so long? All these organizations, they were deceiving us, you know, saying that we need to find a peaceful solution. Here is the war. We are doing it. We are about to return. Meaning, why did we wait to fight for so long? Yeah. Wow. This is, a, and, and I mean, for me, it's a tragedy, really, because uh -huh. what we see currently happening inside the conflict zone, it's uh, even in my worst fantasies, and even what we wrote in our report in 2017, my first report for Crisis Group. And we received so much criticism for this mm. report because we, we basically we are describing how this war will develop and how that the civilian casualties will be major, that there will be huge problems with uh, protection of infrastructure, that there can be involvement of regional powers. And, uh, and, and what I see now is that it's even worse. Uh, for f fifth day, uh, you know, this is the fifth day when Stepanakert receives rockets uh, uh, each uh, hour. I spoke to a friend yesterday. He is a foreign journalist, a French journalist. He finally was able to get out of Stepanakert, and he told me that he spent two days at, at the basement, at the shelter, just because it was impossible to get out because the, the city was getting bombarded um, every hour. And we saw cluster munition being used, you know, in the city, which does not have uh, soldiers inside. 
And uh, the numbers of uh, always rockets used on both sides is enormous. When I speak to the specialist, like e today, early in the morning, I was talking with some specialists in this, and they're telling me that they have information about even more weaponry, you know, being prepared, more military jets uh, being flying over the region. And I understand that the worst is really to come. What we are seeing now, it can be just the beginning. And if we are not able to cease with fighting, then, you know, I'm afraid that we become um, even kind of with uh, feeling that some, some have that with an existential issue now, it will become something of a reality. I'm so sad to say that, really. You, you spoke about, uh, uh, and first of all, I want to say, you know, having traveled with you, I know your passion. No, passion, obviously which comes across for peace. I've, I've seen you taken uh, to task by some of your Armenian friends who felt that you were too neutral, if you will, and, 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 and trying too hard to find common ground. And, and, and I want to say also, and maybe you could comment on this, you know, we, w this is what we try to do at Crisis Group. You, you spend your time in Armenia. We have a colleague who spends his time, Zohar, in Azerbaijan. And you both work together. And everything you do, you both do together and try to make sure that it reflects both the point of view of the Armenian side and the Azerbaijani side. And I'm on a personal note, and I know that you have suffered, your family has suffered from this conflict. I believe that Zaur's family has suffered as well. Are you, you're still able, I assume, to work with him and to look beyond the personal, the emotional side. Um, how has that been, your interaction with, with Zaur and as, with Azerbaijanis in general, in terms of maintaining that sense of beyond the whatever anger and passion, the re real passion is to try to resolve the conflict? Well, I believe that uh, friendship is precious. Uh, professional relationship, uh, they are very important. I have not only my colleague Zaur, uh, but also I have uh, my great classmates. I worked in the past and I'm very proud of this, so that uh, with people who are ethnic Azerbaijanis, that they are my friends. And uh, we discuss and we speak about this, you know, and we spoke even when all these tensions were growing. And I think uh, it's uh, something that we, as the first, basically, generation that did not take the war, we are able to do, you know. We were able to build new relationship, new links. Of course, it was definitely much deeper and broader before the war, when people lived next to each other. In this conflict, uh, ethnic Armenians and ethnic Azerbaijanis are completely separated. And in many cases, the only way is how people kind of construct relationship is through different projects, civil society, kind of, you know, programs. What I'm afraid of is that with this current fighting, we are delaying with, you know, with perspective of uh, again finding with soul or environment when people like me, Zaur, and my friends are able, you know, to say that, yes, the only solution is peace and we need to find a way. If all previous formulas did not work, let's try to find something different. This war has put people like me, who had been calling for this solution, in a very tricky position. Especially since the very first hours, I, I have been seeing the names of the people I know in the list, so you know, of the military killed, of the civilians killed. I, I, know, I know some of these people in person. But, but it's, a, it's really very sad to realize that the potential that we had of using with generation, the first generation, after we were in the 90s, that we are basically demolishing it uh, with the current fighting going on. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we're talking with Olesya Vartanyan. Unless, yeah, can I ask, and I think it's so powerful for all of us to hear the sense of tragedy and also I think what's coming through is a sense that for both sides, this may be becoming an existential battle, uh, the, the worst possible kind, I suppose, in, in many ways. Can you tell us a bit more, what is the sense of those in the Nagorno-Karabakh region? What is at stake for them? What is your sense of how they see what is happening right now? Well, for them, uh, when I speak to the people who I know, and I spoke to some, to many of them, you know, on the phone in recent days, uh, some of them had to leave the region because 
uh, either their apartment building was uh, destroyed by the rocket or that it just became too dangerous and they had to flee the territory. Some of them became displaced people, you know, for the second or third time in, in course of this conflict. And when I speak to them, I, uh, on the one hand, uh, I, uh, I can feel, I can sense that they are extremely sad, but on the other hand, they are super angry. They are angry that they are put in such a position. They are angry that uh, we uh, um, has become such a huge fight. We are having dozens and dozens of people getting killed every, every several hours. And that affects now not only just kind of, you know, only those uh, who live inside the conflict zone like it was in the 90s. It affects the whole region. And the worst thing is that when uh, the, with kind of common understanding that we already have that it's not finishing anytime soon. Well, yes, yeah, so one, one of the reasons you say it, it may not end anytime soon, and one of the new elements, and you alluded to it earlier, is the foreign involvement. Um, when, when I talk to people about what distinguishes this from what's happened in the past, they say, well, there's more foreign involvement. They, they point to Turkey first and foremost on the Azerbaijan side, I'm curious how how is that affecting the dynamics? How are people perceiving that? And how decisive is it? In other words, would things be different if, if Turkey weren't there? Uh, would Azerbaijan determine to go forward no matter what? I think uh, Turkey's current role uh, definitely um, definitely does not contribute to any kind of attempts to at least reach a temporary ceasefire. Just earlier today, Turkish foreign minister went to Baku and we again heard that uh, um, Turkey is ready to support with all means. And with the phrase with all means that President Erdogan declared during the first hours of the fighting, that brings uh, such a terrible uncertainty to the story because uh, we all kind of ask ourselves, does it mean that Turkey will just continue doing what they have been doing for years, like uh, sending weaponry to Azerbaijan, uh, providing intelligence support, uh, or it's something more? And Turkey is ready to intervene directly to the conflict zone to take part uh, openly, doing this openly. Or uh, it's uh, ready to open a new front at its eastern border with Armenia. All these uh, things related to Turkey supplying additional weaponry, military jets, military vehicles. You know, there are so many discussions about this. I would probably not go into all the things that we are currently trying to verify. But uh, what we saw is that uh, in early August, there were the largest ever military drills uh, between Azerbaijani and Turkish armies uh, on the territory of Azerbaijan. And there are some speculations, you know, what have been happening after that and before the fighting started. And the other speculation is, of course, the participation of mercenaries uh, brought by Turkey from Syria. And I will be very honest with you, when I first heard uh, this thing, it was several days before the start to the with fighting. I heard it uh, from journalists uh, who work in Turkey and they work only on Syria and Libya. They never have worked on South Caucasus. And uh, that just sounded so crazy, you know, the whole story itself, that I, I personally could not really believe that it could happen. I thought that probably it's just another fake news or something. But what's happening just in the recent days is that we are seeing more media reports and with the interviews and some of the journalists sent me the photos of the people who they interviewed just to show to me, you know, that this is true. And in addition to that, nearly every day we see more and more videos produced by we Syrians uh, themselves. You know, we see the official video of the MOD of Azerbaijan, of them taking an Armenian position. And then we see the video of the Syrian guy who is uh, clearly speaking Arabic and who is doing all, all the things that, that are definitely not, have nothing to do with our region. And uh, exactly at the same location at the same time. But again, these are the things that uh, on Honestly, people like me could not believe that uh, that could uh, happen in the South Caucasus just because the South Caucasian context is so different from what we hear about Syria, about Libya and some other places. Now, the other actor who could get involved, either for, for better or for worse, is Russia, which had brokered the, 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 the ceasefire uh, in 2016 and which has a some kind of defense cooperation agreement with Armenia, which Armenia could invoke if, if, you know, if it felt under threat. What is your assessment of, of whether we're going to see Russia step in in a more muscular way? At what point are Russian interests going to be affected by what's happening and by Turkish involvement in the, in the Caucasus? 
Well, Russia has been keeping this very kind of neutral position uh, since the very beginning of the fighting, and I think many are surprised, both here in the region and also in the outside public, you know. And uh, everyone is asking this question, why Moscow is so silent? And I believe there are two reasons for that. One is uh, the Russians uh, understand that they, if they intervene and, and take the Armenian side, then they automatically lose Azerbaijan with its uh, biggest economy in the region, with its biggest population here in the South Caucasus. And uh, the second thing, I believe that they m might uh, act instead of just saying things. So we, we may see just them taking the actions uh, and instead of uh, just kind of, you know, warning someone or kind of sending certain signals. We saw Russia acting like this in the neighborhood before as well. And um, I can tell you that uh, uh, when I spoke to the Russian officials for research, you know, for our papers, uh, when we met, they were clearly saying, you know, that uh, what we want is uh, our military presence in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict zone. Here is our peace uh, offer. If it does not work, then there will be the war and we would still have our troops on the ground. And that will not matter to us which side we are going to take. So I don't, I don't think that they are just kind of going to calmly watch uh, what's happening. And uh, also the story with these mercenaries, I think uh, this is something that, they, that can definitely provoke more actions from their side, just because uh, Russia is extremely sensitive to things like this uh, in, in the region, which is at the border with its uh, northern Caucasus. Meaning Russia would be, would be more compelled to react as there are increasing stories of Turkish paid mercenaries being on the ground. I think so, yeah. With this, these are the signals that we have been receiving so far, that on the one hand, we see diplomats calling for ceasefire in Moscow, but on the other hand, kind of serious guys, security guys, they are all talking about mercenaries. And this is something really very significant uh, if we take the Russian context. Well, listen, that's fascinating. And I think we are starting to think there could be a part two and a part three to this conversation. But, but if I could ask you to react to, to something that I think we also appears to be in the air, along with the stories of various mercenaries, both on the Turkish and Russian sides, according to some news stories, is the idea that potentially Armenia would recognize uh, Nagorno-Karabakh's independence in order to facilitate taking a kind of different posture vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan. Can you tell us anything about this story? Uh, we have been uh, uh, hearing always calls uh, for the recognition of Nagorno-Karabakh, or the Armenian name is Artsakh, you know, since the very first hours uh, of this fighting. This is kind of, you know, one of these uh, calls that has been around for a number of years and all the time, not just the current leadership in Armenia, but the previous ones, they are also had to find ways how to explain to their public why they are not going for this type, why they are not um, recognizing Nagorno-Karabakh. And in previous cases, this was uh, uh, with hope that we can reach uh, the peace uh, through talks. And for talks, we need to be patient and not to rush uh, for these recognitions. Let's find a way maybe we can find a compromise and, uh, and, and, and there will be the support of the international community in that sense. I'm, I'm afraid that the longer this fighting takes and also the uh, uh, the greater is uh, or with number of uh, casualties with all these continuing attacks of Stepanakert. And if, especially if the, that uh, fighting becomes of a larger scale, uh, it will be more and more difficult for anyone in, in power in Yerevan to continue keeping silence, uh, you know, uh, while uh, we've always intensified calls uh, for the recognition. But look, I think uh, so far they haven't done this. Uh, in Yerevan, mainly because they understand that uh, that will be the end. Basically, you know, for any potential to resume negotiation process anytime soon. This will be a declaration from the Armenian side that we lost any hope. In the talks, we are getting killed and this is the, uh, the, our last resort and we are undertaking this step. So this is a good segue to what will be uh, the last question. I think, as, as Nas said, we could go on for a long time uh, would, and, and would love to have you back. The last question, you just spoke about um, negotiations, talks. You and I have had this exchange now for the last week. You know, Crisis Group is in the business of, of not just describing the conflict, but trying to find a way out. And you've been telling me, yes, I know, but 
there really is no short-term fix here. It's not going to be a quick fix. This is this may because people didn't pay attention to the warnings for the past few months. We've gotten to this point, and it's unfortunately tragically going to play itself out. So I'm going to press you now in front of other people, all of our listeners. What do you think could be done? Because you know this, as you just described it, this really could snowball into something quite much worse and deader than we've seen. So what would you recommend now people do to try to bring this to an end as quickly as possible, even if that's not quick enough? Ceasefire right now, just right now, you know, without any kind of delay, without any kind of uh, more advance or more attacks, especially in the civilian areas from both sides. And uh, with all these regional powers, and I mean Turkey primarily, stop uh, making all these calls, you know, of support, go ahead, guys, we are with you. We, we should stop right now. The second thing, they should uh, meet to discuss uh, all these uh, things related to the ceasefire so that at least we can evacuate corpses, uh, you know, of the military. There are hundreds of them. And they are put in plastic bags. And for more than 10 days, uh, it's uh, something that uh, one has to handle, you know. Just very immediate things of the support of displaced people who, for example, I spoke to one woman who just arrived to Yerevan. They did not even have clothes because their apartment was destroyed with a rocket. And uh, look, we wrote the report and we spent two years. You know how difficult it was for us. We released it in December of last year and that looked at three main essential issues of the land return of these territories. The second one, it was status of Nagorno-Karabakh and the third one, security arrangements. And we look at these things uh, that are current realities, you know, current thinking in different places, in Stepanakert, Baku, in Yerevan, and also in Moscow and some other capitals. And uh, that report clearly showed that the formulas that we are still using, it's just not relevant. And we need to have a more substantial conversation. We cannot just say territory is here and status there. We could do that uh, just like a, a month after the ceasefire in the war in the 90s. But uh, too many years have passed and too many things, you know, added to that. We need to, the, to have a proper conversations, an honest conversation about each of these elements that will construct uh, the peace deal. And uh, it will be extremely difficult to do, but there is no other way. Well, I really want to thank you. Thank you for, for being with us uh, today uh, and for sharing all your, your thoughts and, and, and both personal and, and, and professional and political and for all the work that you've done with us for the years and you're continuing to do now in very trying circumstances. My thoughts and uh, to, to your family, I hope they're safe. I hope that those in Azerbaijan are safe too, because of course there's been suffering uh, on, on their side as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Rob, this brings us to our last segment where you tell us uh, what crisis group publications we should be reading this week. So uh, a few. Uh, well, you should always read everything. But what we had this week is uh, a, a report on Colombia called uh, Leaders Under Fire, Defending Colombia's Front Lines of Peace, which is looking at what really has been an epidemic of killings of social leaders which is endangering the, the peace accords. And it's a really very deeply researched report. Another one in Latin America, a commentary on violence in Mexico, which looks at how the war on drugs, sort of this uh, U.S.-Mexican co-production, has in many ways led to a proliferation of, of armed gangs and a proliferation of violence. And the levels of, of criminal violence in, in, in Mexico are off the charts. A, a, a commentary on an issue that we discussed last week, which is reports that the U.S. is considering designating the Yemeni Houthis, the rebel group, as a foreign terrorist organization, mm. something that uh, certainly is not going to help diplomacy uh, in Yemen. And then a shout out to our sister podcast, The Horn, uh, which uh, our colleague Alan Boswell produces. And it's this week is on Eritrea and uh, its phenomenon of one man rule. He'll be talking with the former BBC Africa editor, Martin Plout. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening to Hold Your Fire. Do feel free to send any questions you have to media at crisisgroup.org, and we'll be happy to address those next week. And if you're listening through iTunes, leave us a rating or a review. Before we go, I wanted to thank the Crisis Group team responsible for the production of this podcast, especially Jorge Gutierrez Lucena, Michelle Mullaney, Julia Dixon, Nicole Anselmo, and Karim Lebhor. 
Have a good week, everyone. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.